this time I'm digging into a smaller problem, uh, which I'm working with right now, together with my colleagues, about <coughs> incentives. Can we get rid of that one? Yeah. Um, incentives for research, and it's a really interesting thing uh, to give money for publications. To, to, for example, in, in Turkey, I think they, they uh, give money for each publication in, in a ranked journal. Um, uh, it's quite a sum. The same in Spain <coughs> today. Bulgaria as well, no? no China. China, China, of course, China, yeah. But there, there's a lot of uh, rumors about China, so I, I don't want to go into China. We don't know what is really happening there, but we know some about what is happening in, in our countries. Um, Sweden has had uh, a, an incentive system for universities, not to the individual. That is a difference, of course. You give money for, for uh, publications to a university, and uh, they get, for example, 13% of, of uh, all the money that goes from, from the, from the uh, government directly to universities. Uh, this creates a, a sort of strategic problem for the university. How do they act in order to be able to get grab as much as possible? Is it going for high-impact publications only, or should they uh, try to, to publish as much as possible in, in all places? And how, what, what would be the best strategy? That is an interesting question, I think. And um, We see from, from different countries that the, there has been a sort of move towards going into the direction of that productivity, high productivity uh, at the international level is, is uh, sort of doing harm to science. You, if you publish too much, that will be harm for, for, for your career, more or less. And, and I think that that is a very strange thing. It, it doesn't really fit with my, with my prejudice, and, and maybe we should dig into that a little bit more. But, this is a, a publication, the title of a publication that was uh, in Nature 2002 by Linda Butler, a researcher at the uh, Australian uh, um, Research Council, I think, or she was financed by the Research Council. And she said that the list of published paper is no measure of value. Uh, so the Australian system that was introduced in 1996 sort of didn't produce anything good. It, it rewarded quantity, not quality. Uh, and and uh, that was what she was after. This is a, a picture of the, of the, of the paper in, in, uh, in, in Nature. And, and we go further to this, the figure. What she showed in her paper was that uh, if, you, if you then uh, divide all the journals, in, in this case in, in science citation index, or only natural science and physics, chemistry, and so on, by journal impact quartiles, you would have, uh, you could see then the development over time from uh, the four year period, 98. Uh, 8 to uh, 85, and five-year periods, sorry, sorry uh, up to 99 then. And uh, she, she puts a line in 1991, 92 something, 91 we guess, as you see, the introduction of publications collections. So already the case that research councils and, and universities sent publications, listen, list of papers that they have contributed to 
to the ministry or the government or the Ministry of Education created a sort of incentive for researchers to publish more. This is what is, is, she says here. Introduction of publications collections. Um, but what was disturbing from her point of view was that what you see is quartile one uh, is, has an increase. Quartile two has also an increase, but quartile three and four has the highest increase. Um, uh, and uh, sort of that is, this is the share of all publications in a science citation index. So in this, at this time it was maybe four or five thousand, at most uh, four or five thousand journals. Um, the implications of this was when you introduce anything like this, you introduce uh, a sort of incentive that goes, makes the researchers to, to think uh, uh, fast and, and to make it as easy as possible. So if you publish in the low rank journal, you will probably make it easier for yourself and grab the money for the university in this case because Australia used a system where the government paid the universities. Um, so it's a very sad view on how researchers act, how they think and what, what, how they react on incentives. They are like animals, uh, just don't take any, anything of no responsibility for quality. So of course, <clears throat> there, there are room for questions here. Is it really the case that an output-based funding system which counts papers results in a, uh, 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 will result in a decline of quality? And how do we measure quality? Um, do we find perverse effects of such a system? And, and what would perverse, perverse uh, effects be? So I will go into that a little bit and, and discuss, and then I will also show some, some results from Lithuania, uh, which can throw some light on, on, on this discussion. I'm not sure that it will answer your questions that you <laughs> uh, uh, introduced, but um, I think it's still, I hope it's interesting questions. Um, so in order to, to be able to uh, to, to say anything about this, we, we had to do some sort of replication. We had to do, uh, do it all over again, to use the, more or less the same data. But we didn't get the data from Linda Butler, the, the really the data she used. That's, that would be possible, but it's, it's not really interesting because she used a database, Science Citation Index, nowadays hosted by, by and, and created by Thomson Reuters, or or a Chinese now, we don't know if uh, Thomson Reuters has sold the, the database, they say. I don't know. I hope the one who, who bought it will keep it <laughs> as it is, uh, because I'm very fond of it. Um, so we, we do a, a, a replication using the same data. And, and we also introduce, of course, some, some new indicators of quality because journal impact is maybe not the best way to measure quality because this is quality of, of um, uh, average publication in, in journals uh, and, and that is, uh, it doesn't tell you much about what the, the, the quality of the Australian papers in those journals? Of course not. Um, there are a lot of other quality dimensions that you could, for instance, you mentioned some of that, sort of uh, 
having, having some relevance for, for the business uh, uh, would, would of course uh, be uh, of interest to investigate upon, but we will not take care of that in, in this investigation, uh, in, in this, in this uh, work, not at all. Um, and that would be a real challenge. Um, so why do we do this? Well, we, we, we have to remember that knowledge is tentative and, and not solid. Um, uh, and until it's falsified, we, we, we tend to believe in it. Um, if, we, if we try to falsify, uh, that would make the Linda Butler claim much stronger. It would be a second analysis with the same data, and that would, would, would be very good. Then. So, of course, it's interesting to do it. Uh, but as we know, it's very seldom that researchers, especially in the social sciences, do these type of replications. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, we, we seldom go into others' work because it's sort of, we, we tend to uh, think that it's private property. And data is private property, that, uh, which is not really the case. Um, and that is sad because journalists and politicians, uh, they often believe in single results. We don't have the same situation in, in the sciences, in, 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 in the natural sciences at least, where a result always triggers new uh, investigations um, with the same data or, or with, with competing data. Uh, and uh, the, the trouble is that one outcome becomes the truth. And this is really the case with Linda Butler. This has become the truth, that researchers who publish much uh, do harm to science. And it's much, much smarter to, to be prudent with your publications and publish as little as possible in the top-ranked journal and have uh, a very high uh, uh, score in, in your citations. Um, so, uh, as it is today, we have a, a number of different initiatives where they're asking for responsible use of indicators. And the, the Linda Butler paper has, has a huge impact in, in that discussion. So it's, a, uh, for example, the Leiden um, rules for, for, for uh, bibliometrics include a, a skeptical view on, on productivity. It's also something that has touched uh, the, the political uh, community in uh, the academic community and the political community in, in the Netherlands. So the SEP is, has abandoned productivity as a criterion for, for uh, quality uh, 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 in, in the national uh, uh, evaluations. Uh, and Linda Butler has also become sort of a, a, a name in the, in the salami slicing discussion. Uh, that you, you, you do harm to science by splitting up your publications is in as ma many as possible. But we, when, when we look into it, the underlying mechanism of Butler's fundings are quite unclear. Uh, and if other em empirical evidence is lacking, replication is really important. So uh, what we need to understand is... Uh, we, we need a sort of theory of behavior uh, in order to, to be, be able to, to also explain why things happen. And if we look into what we know about motivation and commitment of researchers, so, so it, it's nothing there who indicates that productivity would be uh, something problematic. So normally, uh, if you are 
if you are in, in, in the research business, you want to do results, you want to produce, you want to go further, you want to take another step, you take the next step, you want to collaborate with this one and this one. So you, you want to spread the word or your ideas all around the world. That is, that is sort of the basic idea. Uh, and uh, uh, for the, the, the reference here, Pelson Andrews, Andrews uh, was um, uh, uh, did, did some very huge uh, investigations in the 1960s on, on uh, motivation and how, how researchers uh, uh, were, became produ productive and, and published that in, in, in books. Uh, van der Weyden and with my colleague Peter van den Besselaar uh, did some follow-up studies in, in uh, last year, which also thinks that this is the case. So uh, if we look at scientific creativity, it's uh, a clear theory that uh, you become creative when you, when you have ideas and, and you, the more you try, the more hits. So you cannot be very prudent with your ideas and, and, and your, your tries. You have, to, you have to do as much as possible. The more you do, uh, you, the more you will be able to, to uh, have, an, uh, have a hit. And, and uh, uh, that in, in this case, the more articles you write, it's more possible that you have uh, high impact uh, uh, on, on these, on at least some of, of these. And if you only publish a few, three papers over a, a 10 year period, you have to be very, very lucky in order to have a, a, a hit. But if you publish 30, 40, 50, of course, uh, the number of hits is uh, more, more uh, possible. And so that is Simonton who, who has uh, uh, done this in, in a book on creativity in science. He's a psychologist. Uh, and uh, I think this goes very well together with uh, uh, empirical evidence on uh, quantity, the, the, the number of papers per, per individual researcher, per, uh, per researcher which we now are able to do in, in, uh, in different investigations. So uh, Van den Besselaar and Sandstrom 2015 is a study of all Swedish researchers, 48,000 researchers, uh, and uh, looking at those who publish top papers, top cited papers, sort of the top three and a half percent it is, uh, and how many papers do they have over the period of four years? Uh, in this case, it's, it's very laborious to do this uh, disambiguation of, of uh, researcher names, uh, but it has been possible for Sweden, and La Riviere and Costas done, has done that in, 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 in a, a parallel uh, for, on I think, uh, uh, global data. Um, so looking at top 10%, high, high, uh, then uh, field normalized, of course, papers. And you see that there is a, a, a clear trend that the more you publish, uh, the more, more uh, uh, papers you have in, in uh, uh, top 10. And it's the same for, for uh, top three and a half on, or, or things like that. So I don't go further into that data. I can, I can explain it more. If you look at, uh, this is then top three and a half percent, and you do this by field, you see that there are some differences. Uh, on, the, on the right side, you have the, the scale for Natural science, life science and medicine, chemistry, physics, engineering, and uh, uh, psychology, education, environmental, and geography, and agriculture. And on the left side, 
computer science, mathematics, humanities, and social science, pol politics, and economics. Uh, but the, the trend is quite clear for most of the areas. Although you find in humanities uh, uh, a downward trend, uh, uh, and that is because I think also in computer science and math, uh, computer science they have a different audience. So when you become more productive, you also tend to publish in in other uh, um, publication uh, types of publications, books, uh, reports. Uh, Invest, governmental investigations and, and things like that. So you don't end up in, in, uh, in this case, in web of science, um, arts and humanities citation index or social science citation index. But you have to be productive. And in this case, we work with different uh, productivity classes. You have those with one paper. Uh, let's see if, if we can. Uh, of course, so, so the dots here are for different pro productivity classes. One paper, two papers, three and four, five to eight, nine to 16, uh, 16 to 32, and 33 and more. Uh, but if you ha if you, when you have 33 and more, uh, you, you have clearly uh, uh, an advantage and you produce more high-sighted papers. And what is the thing with doing high-sighted papers, the top three and a half in this case? That is, of course, things that changes the research front in that specific area, in this speciality. That is what, what is really important. If you, wa if you want to contribute to science, you have to be in top 10%, at least. If you want to change it, you, you, you should be in, in uh, among the, the, the absolute best. And so, so of course, in, in this case, these, we see that those, you have to be very productive in order to do that. Otherwise, it's just by chance. Um, so let's now go to what happened in Australia during the 1990s. As in many other countries, there was a decline in, in uh, production and uh, uh, sort of things went down, uh, at least also in Sweden. We went from, from a high in, in, in general impact level to lower levels. That depended partly on that the, in, the, the, the Web of Science database, or ISI as it was called at that time, is of course a, a living materia. It changes all the time. It went from three, 4,000 journals covered and indexed to maybe seven, 8,000. And of course, in that process, they included more countries. And it became much harder to, to ha keep your, your percentage of pub publications in the database. So of course, when, when China started to go scientific, or whatever we call it, they, uh, and, and they, they also, Web of Science started to cover and index a lot of Chinese uh, um, journals. And it became sort of uh, a revolution within inside the, the Web of Science in, in, in from 2000 and, and onwards. And 2007, they included a lot of new regional uh, publications, uh, journals, uh, also Lithuanian, I guess. Yeah. So, in order, but in order to meet this sort of crisis for Australian science, as it was called, as it was called in, in some uh, um, reports, uh, government started to discuss a new funding system that was announced in 92, but not implemented before 95, 96 uh, in that budget. Then. Uh, the, the problem then, when, when, because in, in, when Butler then continued with her uh, 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 analysis and, and published in, in a, a very influential article in Research Policy in 2003, and, and also a chapter in an edited book in, in 2004 about bibliometrics, 
what happens when government starts to in give incentives? What happens with, uh, yeah. And, and in her claims was that, yeah, quantity goes up, but quality goes down. You will have a lower average impact. And she showed that using sort of national science indicators, which was a, a, a part of, of uh, Web of Science that was uh, um, then available for, for many universities at that time. Uh, but something that was introduced in 95-96, of course, it's very hard to, to see what would be the, the effects very soon after 95-96, if you, because she didn't cover the period after 98 in her, in her uh, papers. So we, we start to, to investigate upon that and, and use then a similar database it's called Insights today. We have more, very much more in, uh, indicators and new indicators. We have a longer period because Butler's analysis stopped in, in 1998, which is crazy for something that started in 1996. Uh, we use actual citations, not really the, what would uh, uh, journal impact factor then, actual citations. And uh, uh, we, we have just submitted a, a paper then to Journal of Informetrics on this. It's gone through the first round of peer review. Perverse effects of output-based research funding. Butler's Australian case revisited. Uh, so yeah, just have a look at the timeline. And I think that's, that's important. So if you, if you write a paper in 91, it will be published in 93. If you write a paper in 95, 96, you will have that published in 98, 99. And of course, you won't have figures of citations before first 2001. Uh, uh, so, so timeline is quite, quite important here. Um, so the new, what we call new analysis then. Output goes up, that's really true, same as Butler, but uh, the same holds for top 10% cited papers, which I said was a very important indicator, which then indicates that we have a, an increase in quality. And this holds whether we compare to the world or if we compare to a more relevant comparison, uh, Australia in, in, and, and the Western countries. Uh, so, so let's look, have a look at uh, then Australia in relation to world average. This is the line for, for uh, papers, which really goes up after this. And this is then uh, the, the, the right scale uh, to the right, which is the percentage of papers from Australia. But it went down in, in that period because the, the, the database uh, were changed. And, and uh, 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 quite a, a strong uh, decrease in impact, which is then, uh, in this case, top 10%. But that changed around this, this time. It's not, not here. We don't see a, a change. But in 97, maybe from 19, 97 to 98, 99, and it starts to go up. To go up. And, and Australia has kept the, the more or less the, the same system, although it's more like the, the, the UK system today. But that started in uh, after 2007, I think. Uh, this is the more relevant comparison where we uh, compared to, to a set of countries. Uh, also, in this case, you don't see the same dip because other countries are not in, uh, involved. This is Sweden, uh, Netherlands, um, Germany, France, uh, Italy, and, yeah, well, European countries. Japan is also included. Uh, 
the, there, there is a, a, a change here from, from, from the dip in, in, in 96, 97. Uh, and uh, it, it, th that changed. Uh, it, we don't know whether it's really the incentive scheme who changed this, of course. It's impossible to say what is the... the but uh, we just described what, what happens and, and can, can give another picture than, than Butler gave. And you see, when you compare to, to the different countries in, involved here, uh, that uh, Australia was managed to stop the decline and, uh, and, um, and not many other countries were, could do that, although there are, are of course, some, some very special countries who goes uh, um, in, in the other direction, Belgium, for example. And Sweden was another country with the same type of problem, uh, which hasn't been able to, to change things before 2010, two years after the introduction of the, of the incentive scheme in Sweden, which, which was based on, on something that I, that I did in, in 2007, uh, still in use. Um, Japan is, of course, the, the trouble in, in this case. Uh, and, and this is top 10%, of course. Then. So if we look at it from the empirical point of view, how is it? 10 minutes. Yeah. Uh, both output and quality goes up. Impact is, uh, uh, actual impact uh, is, is actually going up, and uh, this is contrary to and contrasting to Linda Butler's analysis. So doing much, to do much uh, in, in science is not harmful to, to the impact. Uh, we find the same effect in, in other countries for Norway and for Denmark. Uh, and and it, that, it turns out that it doesn't matter that much how you construct the incentive scheme. I, I, I have the in impression that the, the, the system in, in Lithuania is very complicated, but it, it, the only thing that it should take into account is that if you are productive in humanities, it's not the same as being productive in medicine, of course, or physics, because that you, have, you have to do some field-adjusted production for that, and it's very simple to do that, but if you do that, you, you can actually give uh, incentives to, to individuals or to universities on, on a very simple uh, manner. Uh, we find also that from theoretical point of view, we would expect that to happen. So it's not really uh, going in, in the wrong direction. And we don't have any evidence of perverse effects of output funding. If we look at Australia and, and divide journals into international ones and a national, national is blue here, so they, they continue to publish in national journals, but the, the growth of Australian papers is in international journals. Uh, more interesting is that also when we look at page length, which is the only way we can uh, sort of find, find something that we can illustrate salami slicing. Sama, salami slicing would probably implicate that you uh, have shorter papers, and try to publish things uh, that would normally be nine, ten pages, maybe for five, six pages or something like that. Fewer uh, figures, fewer tables, and things like that. And we know by other investigations that the more tables, the more figures, the lo longer the paper, the higher the impact also, shown by Per Seglen, the Norwegian. Uh, but if you, if, so here, if you look at all these, the same countries, so Australia is on top when it comes to paper length in 12 journals from different areas those uh, where, where there is a substantive 
uh, number of publications, of course. Uh, so, so, sorry, um, Japan is, is uh, uh, then, I guess, from, from langu for, for language reasons, they try to have shorter, shorten it as much as possible. So that is an, an aspect. Um, um, so we have, we should be very careful when we when we talk about and, and use bibliometrics, if we don't have an understanding of of this, uh, the the context in and and uh, underlying mechanisms. So if we have on the one side theories that says that the creativity in science is like this and that and motivation. So motivations from scientists is very important and, and it would be distrustful to the whole scientific community to, to say that they, they try to cheat all the time. It's a very small part of the community who should try to cheat and, 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 and make the easy route. Normally you play it fair, and, and uh, that is probably 99% of, of, of the population. So we, we, we ask for a, for a real radical redirection of the discussion on these I issues. Now some minutes for Lithuania, and, and <laughs> to, to just illustrate uh, are you worried now? <laughs> yeah. um, uh, I, I happen to be that as well, but uh, I, I'm not sure that you should be that. Um, uh, I, I talked about field-adjusted production, and because we have, with, with the help of Eleonora, or Eleonora is the driver of this project, we do uh, uh, sort of harmonization of organization names, so you really can say that the publication from Vilnius is a publication from, from Vilnius. And field-adjusted production makes it comparable between universities in this case. Because if you are in a field of uh, sports science, for example, you, you have a level of productivity, a normal productivity. And in this case, it's compared to, no, to and, and the base is, all Nordic countries, sports scientists in in the, in, in the Nordic countries. So it's, but it's, it, I think it's a fair comparison if, even if uh, levels of productivity is uh, maybe a little bit lower here in, in Lithuania. And the same for chemistry, physics, and humanities, and so on. So you can actually compare, uh, because uh, uh, a, uh, uh, a, a researcher in, in humanities will get highly paid in field-adjusted production-wise for a publication in humanities. It might be five, six times more valuable than, than a, a publication in chemistry. Of course, it depends, all depends on the number of collaborators that you have. So you fractionalize and, and then, but you use this. So it's only number of publications here. And what is important then is, is the, this thing. Core and non-core journals. The number in core journals is of importance. And those who was at the conference last year remember the core and non-core. I repeat that core is those that are in the international publications where there is a citation traffic that is really includes many, many countries and, and not only national or, or bilateral um, uh, Lithuania and, and Estonia, or Lithuania and, and uh, for example, Sweden, but an international. So non-core journals are sort of those that are uh, national and, and keeps it uh, uh, under that uh, uh, national signature. And what you see is, uh, we hope that we've done this correct, of course. We, we're not sure. <laughs> uh, someone should look into that. But uh, that the, 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 this is the, the increase from 
2011 until 2015, so 47, 48% uh, uh, increase in core journals for Vilnius over the time period. It's only five years, so it's quite, a, quite an increase of, of uh, field-adjusted production. Uh, the non-core goes down 23%. Uh, for uh, Gediminas, uh, it's 18% up, 40% down in non-core, you see. Uh, you have for so, some, some exceptional results, you may, maybe you shouldn't go into that, but there, there are those that go down in, in, national, uh, in uh, international core journals and goes up in... in in the others, they are black here because they are the sinners, of course, <laughs> from my perspective. <laughs> uh, so, so that would be, uh, you, should, you should have, if I were the rector, I, I would consider whether this is the right direction or not. But also you have in, in sports science, for example, then an interesting pattern where they have a high growth in, in both ends. Uh, which is, of course, and, and if, you, if you take these, there, there are very, very, very low figures, so you shouldn't draw any conclusion. Uh, just to re repeat now, what is core and non-core? What does it stand for? Uh, core journals has an international scope, also in, when it comes to international authorship. So you have many countries in the, in the authorship. Uh, they have a sufficiently large number of citations and refer references to, to other core journals. So they relate to the, to the other uh, international journals. Citation traffic I, I mentioned. Uh, a number of Lithuanian journals do not meet these conditions as it is today, of course. But the process is underway. And, and uh, formerly we, we had a figure last year that 65% was national authorship. It's now go going down to less than 50. And, it, and we see that there is a process. So there is a relation between the national journals and the international ones and in, in the system. It's not that national journals is, is, something, is a, something that you have on your in your back package and, and becomes very heavy for, for, the, for, for researchers. It's, it should be uh, something that is a stepping stone towards international authorship and, and um, uh, is of course of, of importance for younger ones. If you don't have the idea that you have to publish in Cell, Nature, Science and, and so on, which is in, impossible. This is what happened in Turkey. When, when they had this type of incentive scheme, that if you publish in those journals, you will have a huge amount of money. So what happened? Yeah, they, they try, the, the Turkish scientists submitted 100% more. Uh, I think that, that it's not enough, but many, many papers. And, and that became a... a something that science and nature had to take care of because it's a review system. And it, so it, it made a stress on the re review system. This. It's also the same for China and, 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 and Spain, of course, which is, it's, that is crazy because the, the, the number of published papers in science and nature from Turkey didn't go up. China. Uh, okay, uh, well, um, this is Paula Stefan. Yeah, Paula Stefan. Yeah, yeah. Um, and if you look at in core, non core in, in Lithuania, you see that it's, it's going in the right direction uh, overall. This is all universities then, uh, and, uh, and all, all types of organizations. And if you then uh, have it 
percentage-wise, it's going from 67% non-core to 47.4. So that's a very good trend. Uh, and if you count it in uh, uh, citation-wise, so you have field-adjusted production times the, the publication points, where publication points is uh, if you are in top 1%, you are given 100 points. If you are top 10, 10 points. Top 25, 4 points. Top 50, 2 points, and so on. You, it's a way of keeping uh, an in, uh, integrated uh, uh, and um, indicator. You also see that it's going in the right direction from 40 to 65% of publication points are today in core journals. Um, uh, and if I look at the, the, uh, the salami slicing, it's, we also find that it's actually going in the right direction. The, the mean number of pages from Lithuanian uh, uh, authors is actually uh, uh, becoming higher. So it's very positive news, I would say. Thank you very much.